to talk about pain and suffering. Oh, how exciting, I can hear you say. <laughs> but when we look around us, we can see a lot of suffering. But does it really have to be that way? I don't think it does, and I want to tell you why. The stats really do speak for themselves. Suicide is the biggest killer in men under 50. 20% of 14-year-old girls are reporting self-harm. So what's the actual figure? And stress is the biggest cost of long-term sickness absence in the UK. That is a hell of a lot of suffering. So what is going on? Well, what would we do if we had physical pain? We might take some tablets, maybe put a plaster or a bandage, maybe get some physio. And what would we do if it was mental or emotional pain? Well, we just say, just let it go, move on. It's all in the past. So what would you say if there was somebody lying next to me on the stage with a broken leg and they couldn't get up? Would you say, come on, get up, get moving, stop moaning, what's wrong with you? Mental and emotional pain are inevitable. They're actually nature's way of letting us know that something isn't right inside. But suffering is the thoughts that we have about the pain and that level of suffering is optional. It's those powerful stories that we tell ourselves, like I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, I'm unlovable. These powerful stories that we create and live our lives by, but do we question whether they are actually even true? So how am I qualified to talk to you about pain and suffering? Well, I'm going to talk to you now about a trauma I experienced as a 13-year-old child. I'm just gonna say it in a few words, and it is quite shocking, so I just want to prepare you. 1983, sports day, javelin event, my throw, friend, hit, head, died. It was the worst day of my life. My friend lost her life and I lost my mind. This was the day that I entered into hell. Much later that year at the inquest, the school were found to be responsible because health and safety guidelines hadn't been followed. And my friend and I had both had a right to be safe at school that day. And we weren't. Of course, this was the 80s. We had rah-rah skirts and Duran Duran. But health and safety? Not so much. And we didn't really have emotional pain in the 80s, did we? We just had happy or sad. And if we were sad, we were told, pull yourself together. What's wrong with you? Just get on with it. So I just got on with it. I got on with trying to hide the really intense feelings of shame, guilt, and blame that I was feeling. And then I got on with creating some really destructive beliefs about myself, that I was evil, that I deserved to be punished, and that there was something inherently wrong with me. And then I got on with punishing myself for many years. I used to take a lot of drugs every weekend. I would sabotage any work success that I created and I was in a series of abusive relationships. And that went on well into my 20s and my 30s. So people say to me now, what I'm going through is nothing compared to what you've been through, Liz. So let me just get one thing straight. Your pain is valid. And it's not some sort of competition to see whose pain and suffering is the worst. If you are going through a tough time, if you wake up in the morning feeling bad, and maybe this has been going on for a few more days than you would like, maybe you've had another major row with your partner or your boss, or maybe you've tried everything to make your life work, and yet you're still not happy, then you are suffering, 
And if you are suffering, you have suffered enough. So what might you do if you're feeling this way? Well, initially you might reach for the bottle or some sort of un other unhealthy addiction, just trying to numb or block out the pain. At a later stage, you might find yourself in the self-help section of a bookshop, trying to find the answer. Or maybe even going off traveling, trying to find yourself. I did all of these things, but did they make me happy? <laughs> no, they didn't. And I realize now it's because I was looking for happiness outside of myself. And the biggest shift came when I was on a beach in India and a fellow traveler offered me Reiki. I had no idea what she was talking about, but I thought, well, I'm traveling, I'm open to new experiences, I'll see what happens. And I know now that Reiki is a form of energy healing. So I lay down, fully clothed, with my eyes shut, and she didn't even put her hands on me. Except within an, an hour, I literally felt like I was floating. I felt completely blissful for the first time in my life without the aid of any drugs. Something shifted in me. It was quite profound. My perception changed. And I felt myself connected to something much greater than me, but which I was an integral part. So not long afterwards, I came back to the UK with this newfound perception. But what I then found was I was yo-yoing between hope and connection and despair. Hope and connection and despair. And this went on for several years until eventually I decided to go back to India. And I was in an ashram one evening, which is a form of spiritual community, talking to one of the leaders. And she said to me, loving is giving. And I really want to help you to learn to love again. Why don't you go and hang out in the ashram school with the local kids? So the next day, I walked into the ashram school, ready to have fun. And the head saw me coming and she said, I'll be back in an hour. And she walked out. <laughs> and then reality dawned as I looked down and saw 50 pairs of beautiful three to eight year old eyes staring up at me. And I'm staring down at them, terrified, because I can't speak their language and they can't speak my language. And an hour at this time seemed like a really long time. I thought, what the hell am I gonna do? I started to panic, I started to sweat. And then suddenly I had an inspired idea and I started to sing. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. I couldn't remember the words to the song. <laughs> there was everything on this bus, I was just making up words, but it didn't matter because the kids couldn't understand what I was saying. So I was saying words, making up actions, but before long they were copying me. They were trying to mimic the actions, and then they were on their feet, and we were singing and dancing. It really was one of the most beautiful, heart-opening, and happy experiences of my life. So much so that I decided to stay on for a few months teaching English to these gorgeous kids. And I learned the joy of giving wholeheartedly. I also realized how much I'd hated myself up to this point. And then I started to have compassion, realizing how much suffering I'd created through the beliefs of who I had thought myself to be. So a few months later, I came back to the UK. With this experience of happiness, I thought, this time, I have cracked it. And then yet again, I found myself yo-yoing between hope and connection and despair. Hope and connection and despair. Except this time, I just didn't know how much longer I could put myself through this. The disappointment and utter frustration of never being able to move out of despair for very long was really taking its toll on my mental health. And so eventually, I went to see my GP, and that was just two years ago, 
and I had a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Suddenly, my whole life since the accident made sense. There was a valid reason why I hadn't been able to stay out of despair for very long. And that's because part of my mind was literally frozen back in horror and terror back on the school field that day. I had trauma treatment for my mind and my body and I started to unpick those really core destructive beliefs and powerful stories that I'd been telling myself ever since that day. And what I discovered in turning towards my pain and suffering with love and compassion and walking towards it instead of running away from it was that instead of a monster lurking inside of me who was evil, who deserved to be punished and who had something inherently wrong with her, what I discovered was a traumatized child who was terrified by what she'd witnessed and she was desperate just to feel loved and held and to know that what she was experiencing was normal, that she was normal. And when I realized this, the old story fell away and a new and empowering story was born. In this story, I am the courageous child who, despite tremendous adversity, found a way to survive and eventually even to thrive. In this coming to know who I really am inside, I have found a depth of happiness that before now had just seemed like an impossible dream. And now I'm choosing to share my story to raise awareness around mental health and to show others there really is a path out of suffering. So if you are suffering, please do go and get some help. Don't suffer in shame and silence like I did. You have suffered enough. Thank you.